I do the things that I shouldn't do Then I don't do the things I should I do the things that I've come to hate And I don't do the things No, I don't do the things that are good Who can save me from this mess? Only God can save me Who can save me from this mess? start to pray then I find myself asleep like Jesus said the spirit is willing but this body I live in this body I live in this body I live in is weak who can save me from this land only God can save me who can save me from the sin This flesh, only God can save me. Who can save me from the surf? All right. Good evening, guys. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Say hello to those that are here. Uh, please, those that are here. And hello to you that are joining us at home. We're so glad you're joining us tonight. And I hope you're staying dry with all the great rain that we've been getting. We sure need it, don't we? I understand New York or uh, North Northern California is really getting it. So um, we do uh, want to just move on here. We're in Romans chapter 14 tonight, and uh, we, I thought maybe we might finish it tonight, but I don't think we're going to get that far because there's a lot to talk about, and I want to be conscious of your time. And um, We've been in chapter 14 for a couple of weeks where we talked about, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the idea of disputable matters, and disputable matters being those matters that are not of salvation issue, right? And so Paul basically was saying that on disputable matters, everybody should feel free to follow their own personal convictions. Uh, what are some disputable matters? Well, we talked about food. He, he used that analogy quite a bit. Um, dirt, some people thought certain foods were okay. Some people thought they weren't okay. So, But that's not a salvation issue, so that's a disputable matter. Um, we also talked about the importance of 
following our uh, convictions of conscience, but these all must align with the Word of God. So don't, you know, we're not here to establish some kind of new dogma that is that goes against the Word of God. So we're going to continue in that tonight uh, in chapter 14, where Paul now starts talking about the idea of judging others. So we're going to pick up at verse 10 um, in chapter 14 here in a, min- in a minute, but I'll go ahead and open in prayer. Do we have a, a, a mic here? Okay, Brother DeWitt, we'll start reading at verse 10 here in a moment. First, I'll pray. Father, we thank you for this tonight, this study we're about to do here, Lord, together. <clears throat> Your word, God, has the words of eternal life, God. We believe that each word is Holy Spirit inspired and God breathed. We pray, the Lord, that you would take this, your word, Lord, and translate it to the language of our hearts. Meet us right where we are and bless the reading of your word here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 10. You, sorry, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. All right. Thank you, brother. So there's a lot here. Uh, this whole section, you can tell, is about judging others. And so I just want to start off by asking, why is judging others such a bad thing? Well, you can think of several reasons, but really verse 12 says it like it is. He says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. He reminds us of that. So what is the point he's trying to make here? He's saying that each one of us will give an account for ourselves and answer for our attitudes and actions. Wow. So we got to remember that, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I just started thinking about it for myself. On Here I am on Judgment Day. Of all the things there will be to talk about, <laughs> do I want to be discussing my judgmental attitude towards others, Right? So we're going to answer for that. That's a, that's a, that right there alone should set, set the, the, uh, the story straight and set us straight. But also, I just, I just kind of started thinking about judgment and um, when we get judgmental. When you really break it down, what is our judgment of others often about? I just submit to you that we judge others to feel better about ourselves. Oftentimes, perhaps we feel a little bit holier. Perhaps we feel a little bit justified. Well, we could say that it's because we see the error of their ways, right? I mean, you know, that's true. We're supposed to judge the fruit, right? Doesn't the Bible say that? But if we're, if the, I just occurred to me that if we're really, truly concerned about their lifestyle and the spiritual implications of their choices, Perhaps a better way to show that would be to be on our knees crying out to God on their behalf, right? Praying for them, praying with them maybe, perhaps even witnessing to them, right? I mean, there's a difference between educating people and belittling them. Hello, right? So, again, that's why Paul said in verse 12, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So especially if you read that in some of the other translations, I think basically part of what he's saying here is that your critical and condescending uh, condescending ways aren't going to improve your situation on the judgment day one bit. (laughs) Right? I mean, sometimes we 
maybe we subconsciously think that we're God's enforcers. That's, you know, that's another thing, too. It's like, well, you know, just saying how I see it, right? Sorry, I have something in my teeth. It's kind of bugging me. <laughs> have you noticed that? Been, that's probably not a good idea to be picking your teeth on uh, live stream. <laughs> Sorry for those uh, watching me from home. I'm not usually like that. So apparently there was some judgment being exhibited in the Roman church, right? I mean, we've already discussed the idea that, that there was partisanship, there was divisions, right? There were factions, as it were. There were some divided on the meat versus no meat and uh, vegetables, and there was even some divided on the idea of some days being more sacred than others. And so there was obviously some division going on, but apparently there must have been some judging going on in the Roman church for Paul to be compelled by the Holy Spirit to write this. Um, but judgment is still something that we need to work on today, right? Um, we just Okay, so those might be some reasons why we judge, but uh, I just thought, you know, perhaps it could be a little bit of this too. If we're honest, we just like feeling like we're right, don't we? <laughs> I mean, let's just call it like it is, right? A little bit of indignation, right? We like to feel right, don't we? You ever hang out with somebody that has to have the last word? <laughs> got to be right, you know? Or see, so you see two people arguing that always got to get the last word in. It'll go forever, <laughs> right? They need to join a support group called On and On and On and On. We like to be right. I mean, by the way, that's based in self-righteousness and maybe even a little bit insecurity, but that's another talk for another day, isn't it? <laughs> We're not going to go there tonight, but let's admit it. At, like, at times, we like to be right. It feels good. But have you noticed that it doesn't quite have the payoff that we thought it would? Have you ever been right? And you're just like, hmm. That, isn't the pleasure kind of fleeting? <laughs> because there's almost always damage. There's almost always collateral damage in relationships. We're left with our self-righteous self. You know, we walk away feeling like, okay, I won that one. But did we really win? I don't know. Relationships are damaged. Unity is damaged. That's why there's an old saying. Maybe you've heard this saying, you can be right and be dead right. <laughs> I've, I've used that. I use that often. Uh, you can be right and be dead right. I mean, you know what that means. I mean, you can fill those words, fill those blanks in. And now, that's not, we're not talking about just, this isn't, Paul's not doing a little sidebar here on marriage relationships or friendships or whatnot. This is, we're talking about church unity here. He's talking about a judgmental attitude within the church. So easy for that to rise up, and we're just right. You know, we're just right. Well, you you just got to hear me. You know, you're just not getting it. And um, we can be right and be dead right, and we can be so right that those people that were wrong walk right out of the church, <laughs> right? Right. That's another. There's another saying that I say too, and that is this: the question, "Would you rather be right?" Or would you rather be well? <laughs> now, that's a good recovery question. Those that are in recovery understand the notion of that. We learn to let these little things go, right? We learn to say it is what it is. We learn to say, well, you know what? I'll agree to disagree on that because it's a disputable matter, right? We're learning balance. It's talking about balance here. We're talking about unity in the church is what Paul is talking about here. Unity in the church, but that's also unity in your marriage. Unity in relationships, unity in your parent-child relationship. we got to learn to let some things go, amen? <laughs> major, in the major in the major things, don't major in the minors. And it's sometimes that we got to get that last word in. So, judging. Well, it's easy to judge, though, isn't it? It's easy to feel justified. I mean, especially if we got that good old-fashioned righteous indignation rising up. I mean, I have to admit, I'm just being honest. You know, I look around at what's going on in the world. 
You know, I look at TV shows, I look at commercials, I see the stuff, you know, that's being pr presented to us. The, if you notice, you know, the, the way propaganda works, by the way, if you didn't know it, the Nazis were really good at this. The idea of propaganda is if you say the same thing over and over, people will begin to believe it. And that's exactly what Hitler did with the message of, the, of, the, um, of his whole Third Reich. Um, so the whole idea is, you know, let's just, get, let's just get this stuff out there and keep on saying it and keep on saying it, and we're going to normalize this, we're going to normalize that. And I know I see things in a culture that are, that are in disagreement with what the Word of God says. Hello? We see it all the time. I get a little judgmental, don't I? I mean, I do. I have to admit. We do. We get there. Righteous, old-fashioned righteous indignation rises up. But what about when we're doing it? That's one thing. When we're looking at the culture, we can pray for the culture. But what about in relationships here? And that's what Paul is talking about here. We're talking about relationships within the church, within the church body. And we're talking about protecting the idea of unity we get this righteous indignation that rises up, and I've seen it. You've seen it. We've seen people rise up in this idea that, hey, I'm just speaking the truth. I can't help it if you can't handle the truth, <laughs> right? The Bible says speak the truth with love. So, pow, here it comes, right? I can't, hand, 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 uh, can't help it if you can't handle it. Well, if we don't want to go way over there, but yeah, we don't want to go way over here where at times we are supposed to judge the fruit, Right? What's, where's the balance? Is there a balance? I often say this statement, too. I often say the balance is in the middle. Usually, usually it's in the middle. Unless it's an indisputable matter, that is, by the way. <laughs> I'm, talking about, I'm talking about indisputable or the, the disputable matters here. There are some things that are non-negotiable. That's off over there to the side, right? Christ and him crucified. Amen? And... There every word of the, in the Bible that is written, that is explicit, every word of it, I believe, is true. However, there are some things Paul is saying that there doesn't, the Bible doesn't explicitly address. These are the disputable matters. So where's the solution? What, where's the balance on all of this? Well, I just propose to you that we don't have to make rocket science out of this and that we don't have to look any further than Jesus himself. Amen. <laughs> Because I just want to tell you that Jesus knew the word, what the Word said because he was the Word. <laughs> what does that mean? How can a man be the Word? Well, what is the Word anyway? When we say the Word of God, what does that mean? You know, that's one of those churchy things that we say a lot. What does the Word of God mean? Anybody want to weigh in on that? Why do we call the Bible the Word of God? Pardon? Because his words, literally. Is his word, but how, okay, so how does Jesus become the word? What is, how do we make that correlation? But I just said a minute ago that Jesus knew the word, what the word said, because he was the word. The word of God, especially in the, word, uh, in the context of, of what you read in, in, in the New Testament especially, but, but really it's the Old Testament, it's all of it, is God's thoughts. It's his Direction, it's his vision, it's his law, it's his commandments, it's his whole mind, right? The word of God is God's mind, it's who he is, it's his character, it's everything he, everything he is. So in John 1, of, speaking of Jesus, it says, In the beginning was the word, in other words, God and all of his thoughts and his intentions and, and his character and all of this. And the word was with God and the word was God, okay? So now we get it. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Now, the word became flesh in verse 14 and made his dwelling among us. That's Jesus. So he was part of the Trinity before he came and dwelled among us, right? We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So praise God. So he was the truth. He himself or, uh, encapsulated all of God's mind, his thoughts, his will, his, his vision for us, his, his creation, his commands, everything, his love, his mercy, his grace, all of his attributes. He was the 
um, encapsulation of it all, if that's a word, that sounds like that's a big word there. He came and dwelled among us and walked among us. So I just, I just want to say that if there was ever anyone who was justified in being judgmental, it was Jesus. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Wait, is that true or is that true? I mean, if there was anybody, I mean, you think you're justified being judgmental? Ah, psh. how about Jesus himself? The word of God, the perfect word of God. God himself, his word came in human form and dwelled among us. Right next to me is Jesus here. I mean, just imagine that. He's perfect. He's, he knows my thoughts. He knows what I'm going to think before I even say it. He knows every thought, every word, all my motives, all the stuff that I don't say, all the stuff that I don't let you know about me. He knows. He knows me better than I know myself. And he made his dwelling among us. If there was ever anybody that was justified in being judgmental, it was him. Yet he came in gentleness and kindness. He was meek. And humble, I mean, he came in a manger of all things. We just celebrated that, right? Right? He was not judgmental, yet he did not excuse sin, did he? I mean, he called it like it is. I wish I had time to go to John 8, the story of the woman caught in adultery, right? After all the rigmarole, he asked her, where are your accusers? She said, there are none, they've all left. He said, neither do I accuse you. Now go, go about your way. You're good. You know, no big deal. No. What did he say? Go leave your life of sin. <laughs> right? So he would say the same to us. There's grace. I've forgiven you for much. I'm not accusing you. Now go and leave this that I just freed you from. <laughs> That's why God did not want them looking back when they freed them, when he rescued Lot and his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Because he didn't want them looking back longingly at what he had freed them from. So he said specifically, don't look back. Lot's wife did look back. She was turned into a pillar of salt, right? So if there's anybody that was that is justified in being judgmental, it was Jesus himself. He was not judgmental, he, yet he did not excuse sin. He didn't come to hang out with the holy ones and the ones that had it all together. He came to be with the downtrodden, the outcasts, the hurting, the lepers, the blind, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, <laughs> right? I love that show, The Chosen. They do such a tremendous job of grabbing that whole drama of Matthew, the tax collector, you know. He's even a little bit borderline autistic in, this, in the show because he's just so meticulous. And, and here he was a turncoat. The rest of the Jews saw him as a turncoat. And, you know, an enemy, worse than an enemy, because he was one of them that became the enemy, that worked with the enemy, that worked for the enemy, and yet Jesus chose him. And I love that tension in that scene where uh, when he first, when Jesus first brought him along, and, and Peter and the rest of them were ready to hang him up by a tree, from a tree, man. Like, what's he doing here? But see, I love that scene because Jesus would basically made him straighten them out really clear that, hey, I chose him just like I chose you. You know, <laughs> who are you to judge? So again, Jesus came to be with the downtrodden, the outcast, the hurting, the lepers, the blind, the prostitutes, the tax collectors. He appealed to the rich and the poor alike. He offered wholeness and healing to those with the greatest needs. He laid down the pattern of a humble servant's heart and showed the full measure of his love by washing the disciples' feet. And then he told us, the church, to go and do the same. Right? Didn't he? He set the pattern. He came as a servant leader. And I love how in John it describes it that, uh, that way. He says, and then Jesus showed the full measure of his love or the full extent of his love. By doing what? Hugging them? Giving them good attaboys? No, he got on it. The servants took off his robe and put on the servants' garb and bent down to the lowliest of positions to wash their feet. To meet them. Why? Why? What was the significance of that? To show that he was willing to go to the dirtiest place and be that servant leader that they needed. They didn't even know how much they needed that to him for to set that example to show that he wasn't above going to that dark, their dark and dirtiest place. Why washing their feet? Why is that so dirty? Well, you know, did you know that back in those days it was 
They didn't have plumbing. <laughs> they didn't have gutters. They didn't have dog runs where you could go take your dog. I mean, pretty much the streets was it. It was everything. And camels and horses and any other animal walking down the street. You can only imagine what was in the dirt streets. And they were in sandals getting with their feet getting dirty and stinky and all of that. So you can just imagine how a, a, a foot washer was a, probably the lowliest of, uh, lowest of positions. Jesus showed the full extent of his love by assuming that role, willing to go to their dirtiest place to show him that was the full extent of his love, was that he was willing to go to their darkest and dirtiest place in a physical sense, and he is that way in us spiritually at this, even at this time, he is saying to somebody, he's tugging on somebody's heart saying, I know the darkness in your heart. I know the dirty, the dark, ugly places that you hope nobody else sees. I see that and I'm willing to go there and I don't judge you. And now he asks his church to be the same, to have the same heart, the same attitude. I want to be a part of a church that, that is that way. How about you? I mean, his followers, us, though decidedly imperfect as we are, have throughout the years continued to show God's love and compassion by feeding the hungry, opening hospitals, homeless shelters, recovery centers. Guys, that is the church. Did you know that? Did you know that, that the church? Go back in history. The church is the one is is, is who started hospitals. The church used to run the schools. The church is where all the recovery centers and the, and the um, homeless shelters. That is the church being the church. That was Jesus. That was his example, and that's what he wants our church, us, the church to be. And it was this same Jesus that said in Matthew 7, the famous words, starting at verse 1, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Yikes. There you go. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Oof. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank, <laughs> can you imagine a plank, in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. A judgmental, a judgmental spirit, finding fault in others. You ever, have you ever, you ever been around somebody that that's all, all they do is find fault? All they do is just talk about what's going wrong with the world today. Who wants to be around that person anyway? What a drag. But, man, the church has a reputation for being that these days. Now, remember, I never said once that we don't call the truth the truth. I've, I've part of this crossover vision's name of this church is that the cross is over us and all that we do. I, this the cre Jesus preached or uh, Jesus crucified, buried and, and resurrected in three days will be preached from this pulpit as long as I have anything to say about it. I declare that Jesus is the way, the only way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by Him. So that's truth. But doesn't the church also have the reputation of just always, all we want to do is change people and, and tell them what they can't do. You can't do this. You can't do that. You got to stop doing this. So I just want to ask, I just want to ask us a question to ponder. Do we talk more about what we are against than what we are for? <laughs> what are you for anyway? What is the church for? We know good and well what we're against. There's a lot of people that know what the church is against. Well, you know, the church is full of hate now because this and that. And Well, you know, we've kind of earned a little bit of that reputation by we're just always hammering people about, you know, uh, what you can't be doing. You can't, now I'm not, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not backing down on the Word of God. But you know what? I'm not the one that cleans them. I'm just going to lead them to the one that does do the cleaning, Right? I use this analogy uh, several times. I'll use it again. It happened regarding this church. A person told me that 
to pray for her hairdresser. And she's working on him. And um, now this person that's doing the talking, she doesn't go here anymore, so it's nobody you know, so don't try to figure it out. This happened several years ago. Her hairdresser, pray for him, Pastor. I'm working on him. I think he might come to church soon. He's asking me questions. Okay, good. What's his name? I'll pray for him. Oh, so and so. Okay, but I did. But I know he's he's uh, he's gay. So I know he's going to stop all that and and quit all that before he can come into the church. <laughs> I said, what? Wow, really? That's where you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna tell him that. You're gonna stop being that before you come into the church because that's a really holy place. By the way, don't wear dirty shoes in there either. You can't stain the carpet. I get it. I'm not being facetious. I'm not trying to be coy here. But I just want you to know, I told her, I said, I wouldn't tell him any such thing. I'd tell him to come. We'll show him the love of Christ. We'll lead him to Christ. He'll do the cleaning. I mean, I've, I've, I have literally been in meetings and been around people whose the Bible talks about how our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we're supposed to have control and moderation and all that. I've seen people, obese people, well over 300 pounds, lecture others about self-control. I mean, don't get me started. <laughs> See, we just like to pick and choose. Well, I don't do that. Thank you that I'm not like that guy. Okay, I'm getting a little up on a high horse here. You see, see how dangerous that's a slippery slope that we go down. I want to be, I'm, I'm going to preach the truth from this pulpit, but I'm going to welcome anybody and everybody that comes in the back of these doors. It's not my job to change them or correct them or anything like that. At times, there will be, I'll pray for the Holy Spirit to guide me, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak the truth with love. But it'll be his timing and not my agenda. <laughs> right? You get what I'm saying? When it's his timing and his way, it's right, and it's to be life-changing. Otherwise, it's my agenda, and it just separates. It just divides, and it sends people right back out the door because that's why the people think the, uh, the church is these days anyway. So another way of wording this question here is, are we known more for what we are against than what we are for? <laughs> what are we for anyway? Let's talk about that. And so just recently... I was in a conversation with somebody, and all they wanted to do was argue about, well, you know, Christians these days, you know, this and that, and, you know, you guys, you know, hate this and this and phobias and phobes and all this, you know, all these buzzwords and these uh, uh, sound bites. It's a, it's just the whole conversation was, well, that's all it was was a bunch of sound bites that you, that you got off the Internet probably somewhere, you know. What is, what is that? What and I just was listening to this person talking to me. And, and uh, well, you know, the, if God really this and that, and he doesn't, if, you, if he hates this, then he's not really any kind of loving God at all. And I, and I, and I said, I said this. I, I let, it, let this person talk for a while, and I said, well, um, that's a lot right there. I'd rather talk to you about who Jesus is, <laughs> not what he's against. So that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do is think that we're against this, against that. And I want you to know what we're for. Jesus came for sinners. And I, I was a sinner. And I still am a sinner of my own in and of myself. I'm, I'm not capable of doing anything. The Bible says there's, I mean, Jesus, I, re, I agree with what Paul said in Romans 7. There is nothing good that lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is right and good, but I cannot carry it out. So I'd rather talk to you about what, you know, that's what the enemy wants. He wants to divide us on, on the, 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 the things that you're not allowed to do. Let me tell you what, everything that I have given up for the Lord, I've done, God's done and, and pulled it from me as a, in, a, in a gentlemanly way, and it is something that I wanted to hand over willingly. And everything that I have given up, any kind of any kind of nose that I say to the to the passions of this world now, I don't miss those things. I don't. I am much better off for it. You get what I'm saying? It's not a matter of all the things that I have to give up and the things that I can't do. It's a matter of what I'm getting. 
So, you know, how do you, how do you empty a muddy bucket? We got a whole world of out there of muddy buckets walking around and, and they're miserable and they're hurting and they need the truth. They need the light. How do you empty a muddy bucket? Well, you don't get in there to start carving up and trying to shovel all that stuff out. There's still going to be dirt in there. You stick a hose and let clean water run through that bucket until some, at some point in time, there is no more dirt left, <laughs> right? So it's, the, it's, the, it's that living water, guys. We need to be about what we are for. I'm for the living water. I was blind and now I see. I was drunk and I lost everything. He did for me what I could not do for myself. It's a matter of what we're for and not what we're against. Amen? And that is what I believe is going to reach this world, guys. The world knows good and well what we're against. How about what we're for? You get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? And then, you know what? Then the other things that, that the Bible is against, it, the truth has a way of rising to the surface. Do you ever notice that? The truth divides. It cuts right to the marrow, doesn't it? It does. And so, I, I was in a meeting one time, and a guy stood up and requested prayer at the end of it for God to give him the power to witness to his, can continue to witness to a guy at work that he thought was just on the verge of, of, um, of committing to Jesus. And he literally said this at a prayer, at a, as a prayer request. He goes, but I just need wisdom because I need to tell him that he needs to stop smoking because that's a sin. <laughs> and he can't be, can't be smoking if he's going to be a Christian. Meanwhile, I know it's going to sound mean, this guy had a gut that was just out to here. I mean, you could go up to him and go, ting. And, and, and I caught him afterwards. After the meeting, I, I just walked up to him. I said, hey, brother, I, I, I don't know you. I'm sorry. I, I probably don't have a right to talk to you about this talk to you like this, but what you said in your prayer request? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, the Bible says our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I said, that's not in the Bible. Where does it say in the Bible that smoking is going to send you to hell? He, well, you know, your body, you know. I go, well, what about overeating? It's the same thing. I mean, he just looked at me and just, I mean, I don't know if he was mad at me or what, but he didn't say a word. I mean, but see, that's what we do. We pick these little things and say, you can't do that. You got to do that. You can't change. You need to change that. You know? And that's exactly what Paul is saying is that this is dividing the church. It's, it's, it's uh, presenting disunity. Let's be known more for what we are for instead of what we are against. Does that make sense? So let's get back to the text and wrap it up tonight. Verse 13, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind, get this, to not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating, destroy someone for, what, for whom Christ died. I thought of what Jesus said about suffer the little ones who come to me and don't. And, um, you know, if anybody causes one of these to stray, it'd be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. <laughs> Yikes. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as, as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Did you know that a judgmental attitude towards a fellow believer could cause that believer to stumble? Man, I tell you what, that, that's yikes. That puts a different twist on it and takes it to a different level, doesn't it? And notice Paul says, make up your mind to not be a stumbling block. I mean, that means that we have a decision to make, right? This is a cognitive thing that we can do, can choose by our own volition. It's not something like, well, I feel this, I feel that. Well, this is a decision. Make a decision to not cause someone to stumble. 
And then he basically goes on and reiterates the ideas that we've been discussing over the, the last few times. He said, basically, if you, if you feel freedom to eat meat, great, eat meat. But don't flaunt your freedom and look with contempt on those who choose not to. And don't cause them to stumble with your judgmental attitude, right? But see, again, we, we hide behind that old thing of, hey, I'm just speaking the truth with love. If I can't help it if you can't handle it, right? But see, Paul negates that by saying in verse 15, if your brother or sister is distressed of what, because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Now, by the way, this is not talking about if you eat, like if I don't eat meat and you eat meat in your own house and you're having your own life and eating meat, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about this attitude of where you're in somebody's face and you're condemning them because they're not eating meat with you. That's the, what he's talking about here because he's talking about judgmental attitude. And so in other words, he's saying we are not acting in love if we are judgmental towards each other or towards others. We're not acting in love. So then he says, Therefore, in verse 16, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. King James Version says, don't let your good be evil spoken of, right? That's a version I memorized years ago. So, in other words, hey, if you're doing a good thing, just keep it a good thing. Don't make it cause somebody to stumble. Don't flaunt it to the point where it's going to actually cause somebody to resent you or cause division, right? And in verse 17, he goes on and says, For the kingdom is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Spirit. That's a powerful statement, right? In other words, hey, you know all those things you argue about on social media? <laughs> the things you yell about when you watch the news? That's not the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. How are we doing on those? <laughs> right? Well, there's a time to speak, and there's a time to act. I'm not saying any of that. I'm, you know, shoot, I vote. I'm active, you know. If you want to protest, it's your American right. But let's not make that our dogma. That's not our religion. What is the religion that we are part of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, right? That's what it's all about. Then he closes with this, with this thought in verse 18. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Well, that's interesting. In other words, yeah, you'll please God first and foremost, but then what? But then you'll be able to endear yourself to others and live in unity. That's what that means. We're not trying to please get God and everybody to be happy with us. This is talking about living in unity. I mean, again, I say, who wants to be around a judgmental person, right? It's kind of a drag. So 740, straight up. That's what I usually shoot for. So we're done with that section. You can see why we're not going to finish the rest of the chapter. We'll get to that next time. But... Um, Admittedly, I got on my high horse on a few matters tonight, but I hope that you um, got something or maybe challenged. Any, any thoughts, any questions, statements, rebuttals? Notice I wait for the moment when we don't have no time to ask you for a rebuttal. <laughs> oh, we're out of time, sorry. <laughs> Submit your rebuttal in written form. And triplicate and mail it to our corporate offices. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you, God, for uh, your word that is sometimes tough, Lord, because sometimes it just uh, clashes with our humanity and all of our sensibilities. And God, but there's a sense of being right. But I, I would personally rather be well than be right all the time. And um, I, I, it probably may help me to live longer, too, by the way. But God, more than that, I want to thrive spiritually. I want the righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit. That's the main thing, Lord. 
Help us to be balanced, Lord. Help us to live in unity, not only in this church body, but in our marriages, in our homes, in our workplaces, Father. May we have the light that this world so desperately needs. Jesus called us to salt. Jesus said that we're the light. May we be that salt that adds seasoning and, 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 and spice to this world and, and preserves it, Lord. And may we be the light, the light into the darkness, God. May we have something that this world wants. Just pray that you would be with each family. Pray that for our sick, Lord, we lift up our brother Richard. Lord, I know uh, watching right now uh, from up north and Lorraine, uh, just bless them, Father. We pray, God, that he would indeed be able to get the procedure done that he needs to be to get done, Lord. Pray for divine favor in that and help them to be able to travel home safely with all the craziness going on up there with the weather. Just uh, be with us as we go our separate ways, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.